Greetings friends, today we will dive into the plots of all Halo installments, including Halo Infinite. First of all, a couple of brief remarks on the general storyline. The scriptwriters clearly interpreted lore differently at different times. At some point, we were hinted that humans were the forerunners, whom we'll cover in a moment. At another point, the scriptwriters changed their minds and made humans an entirely separate species. So, there are controversial hints here and there, and it is not granted that in future games other major retcons or plot twists will not be presented to us. Say, a whole lot of things in the series are given via fallible sources. Some facts can simply end up being a hoax shared by certain characters. Secondly, it is evident with the naked eye that games are jam-packed with biblical references. A hail is a synonym of a nimbus. When the creators of sentient life got disappointed in it, they unleashed the flood, the zombifying parasites upon it. The salvation from the flood laid in the arcs, the series is replete with such allegories and illusions. Now let's get to business. As far as we know, the precursors were the eldest and the most sophisticated species in the universe. They were able to traverse between galaxies and accelerate the evolution of living beings, and they used these skills to forward the development of life to their liking. A long time ago, the precursors arrived in the Milky Way and contributed to the emergence of several civilizations, expecting to fill the galaxy with not only intelligent but also decent creatures. It is hard to say for sure, though, what exactly was the precursor's goal, but among the species they created, there were humans and anthropomorphic creatures known to us as the Forerunners. In fact, one of those species was meant to be promoted by the precursors to the superior in the Milky Way. This dominant species was supposed to help its simpler comrades protect them and maintain general order in the galaxy. Which one of those species deserved this title was quite obvious. The precursors were going to appoint the forerunners as the most worthy, mature and responsible ones. However, in the end of the day, the precursors changed their minds about the forerunners as managers of the galaxy opting in favor of humans as better suited for this role. And deeply offended by this shift, the Forerunners waged a war against their creators. What the exact casus belli for this war was is unknown. According to some sources, the Precursors deliberately provoked the Forerunners. Others claim that there was no instigation and the latter just took the insult too personally. The indisputable fact is that the Forerunners declared war on the Precursors and, oddly enough, won. As one version tells, the Precursors posed no resistance, unwilling to hurt those whom they gave birth to. All these nuances are highly unreliable. What we know more or less definitely is that the Precursors named humans the worthiest species, which caused the war between the Precursors and the Forerunners, and the latter almost completely wiped out the former. Those who survived, at least some of them, in fear for their lives decayed into mold, crumbled into dust, to be reborn again sometime in the future, perhaps when times get better. This dust was supposed to form back into the bodies of the Precursors. Years went by and the dust that the Precursors dissolved into began to deteriorate and mutate. When the time to be revived had come, the Precursors re-emerged not the way they had planned. Instead of the most developed species in the universe, some monster creatures, even by the standards of giant space bugs, reappeared from the dust. And these new evil mutated precursors set out to take revenge and ensure that no one opposed them ever again. They decided to send some of their mutagenic dust, known as the Flood, to the Milky Way, where we, humans, the Forerunners, and all our neighbors reside. The idea is that upon contracting the dust, living beings turn into zombies driven by an instinct to infect and consume everyone around them. As they consume each other, they grow larger until they reach the final point, the Grave Mind, a gigantic cast of flesh that serves as a hub for the collective mind of the Flood. At some point, humans, when investigating planets on the frontier of the Milky Way, stumble across the ruins of spacecrafts that were sent there by their predecessors. 
On board of these vessels, they find an unknown powder and take it for research. They cannot find anything special in this powder, and the only notable feature they discover is that it has a good impact on ferro, animals which are kept as pets by some species in the Milky Way. Ferro were used as guinea pigs for testing the powder. It made them more obedient, so breeders implement this substance in animal husbandry. As generations of ferro on whose ancestors the powder was tested change, they begin to sprout tentacles and devour each other. Eventually, the disease is transmitted to humans, and entire planets become plunged into a zombie apocalypse. Humans are losing planets one by one and turn to extreme measures. They start to preemptively annihilate planets with signs of the flood infection. When the pandemic reaches the planets of the forerunners, humans wipe those out as well. The foreigners have no idea of what's going on. They believe the pandemic to be the fiction of the Earth government to use as an excuse when assaulting other planets. This marks the beginning of the war between humankind and the forerunners. In general, humans manage to withstand the heat quite successfully, fighting off the forerunners on one front and the flood on another. In fact, the flood controlled by the grave mind retreated for some time to let people and the forerunners battle each other, although it looked like the parasites were kicked away. Despite this seeming success, humans exhausted their capabilities, fighting onto fronts at once, and eventually were defeated. The forerunners drove all the surviving people to Earth and took away all technologies from them, plunging humankind into the pre-industrial era. They also eradicated all signs of human activity everywhere in the galaxy except for Earth. While humanity was still reinventing the wheel many years after, the Flood came back to be faced by the only remaining ruler of the galaxy, the Forerunners. They had long forgotten how to fight because all their enemies were defeated and they experienced no domestic struggles whatsoever. Given that the Flood is essentially invincible, the Forerunners fail to pose any opposition to cosmic vermin and realize that they are doomed. The approach of humans scorching entire planets and babbling about parasites instantly ceases to be seen as a pointless act of aggression. Having exhausted all other options, the Forerunners constructed the Halo Array, or the Halos, a network of space stations with weapons of mass destruction that are capable of exterminating all sentient life in the Milky Way with a powerful signal of galactic scale. These halos are also referred to as installations, and if they do their thing, everyone in the Milky Way will perish except for those who will be hidden at the halos and in the arcs, another type of massive space stations protected from the array's beams. The idea was to handpick various species of living beings to preserve life in the galaxy, activate the halos, sterilize the Milky Way, and leave the flood with no food. When the parasites starve to death, the galaxy is to be repopulated with those who seek the purge out in the arcs and at the halos. Everything proceeds as planned. The flood has seemingly been defeated, died of starvation, the survivors have been returned to their home planets, and the forerunners, feeling guilty of this whole mess for ignoring humans, failing to cope with vermin and purging the galaxy, go into voluntary exile, leaving humankind in charge. The logic is, if the forerunners couldn't save the galaxy from the apocalypse, maybe humans will succeed next time when it comes, and it will definitely come again. To boost technological progress of those who survived, the forerunners implant certain marks into human DNA to facilitate their instinctive ability to handle the know-how of the forerunners without prior preparation. The forerunners left behind a bunch of artifacts in the Milky Way, and if humans locate them, they will be able to understand easily how to use those. As the years go by, humans are developing at a rapid pace. They re-explore outer space, yet only within the boundaries of the solar system. Contrary to the forerunners who manage to overcome all domestic clashes, people tend to disagree with each other on various matters, causing wars and armed conflicts. So, under the patronage of the United Earth government, a program to create super-soldiers is launched. 
This project, however, is rolled back because of its excessive costs. But when the scale of civil unrest outmarches the intent to save funds, the training of super soldiers is resumed under the name of Spartan II. A scientist named Catherine Halsey managed to significantly improve and optimize the once cancelled program. One of her innovative proposals was to forfeit the practice of recruiting volunteers among law enforcers and to kidnap talented kids instead and bring them up for the purposes of the program. She is given a grant to abduct 75 six-year-old boys and girls from their families. Among them is John, more commonly known as John 117, the key figure of the franchise and the protagonist of most games in the series. Exceptionally smart, strong, fast and with outstanding moral qualities, John completes training splendidly and at the age of 14, along with the rest of the recruits, although why call them recruits if they were kidnapped, it's called test subjects, not recruits, anyways, altogether, they undergo body modification treatment. They are injected with some drugs and implanted with augmentations. Half of the test subjects perish while the survivors become witchers. Kidding. The Grey Wardens. In addition, Catherine Halsey makes a digital copy of her brain, creating an artificially intelligent entity named Cortana. Most likely you are familiar with her if you're using Windows. Meanwhile, somewhere in the galaxy, far away from our system, a new theocratic and militaristic alliance of species known as the Covenant Empire emerges, based upon worshipping the Forerunners as gods. The Covenant misinterpreted a message left by the Forerunners after resetting the galaxy, saying that they activated the Halos and left into exile, allowing the survivors to reclaim the Milky Way. The Covenant decided that the Forerunners activated the Array and thus somehow ascended to a divine state, unlike all other unworthy species that didn't ascend and were left swarming in the Milky Way while the Covenant mistook exile for ascension. Guided by this misinterpretation, they aim to repeat the route of the Forerunners to ascend as well and trigger the Halos to do so. Fortunately, this cannot be done in a snap of a finger, and the worldview of the Covenant starts crumbling when it contacts humankind and realizes that people were in fact left in charge by the Forerunners. Perceiving this fact as a threat to their religion and their standing in it, and unwilling to kneel to humans and reject the initial plan, the Covenant declares war on humankind, hoping to wipe our species off the face of the Milky Way, together with all discrepancies and contradictions brought to the Covenant religion by their encounter with humans. No people, no contradictions. Luckily, the Spartans are fighting alongside humankind. And before we move on from the background to the main storyline, I'd like to note that the lore of Halo shares similarities with a bunch of different games. The plot based on a contagious powder and a planned rebirth reminds of Dragon Guard and Near Replicant. A process of making super soldiers, as I have said already, resembles both The Witcher and Dragon Age, nullifying sentient life for the sake of a higher purpose as well as giant space rings left by a great civilization of the past and the general visual style are common for both Halo and Mass Effect, the Flood and the Gravemind are evidently similar to Necromorphs and the Brethren Moons from Dead Space, some of these was taken by Halo, some of these from Halo, and some features might be purely coincidental, but in summary, the confluence between Halo and a range of other franchises is rather great. We will talk about installments of the series not in release order, but according to a chronological sequence of their events. Halo Wars was the fourth game, but in terms of the storyline it was the first, and contrary to most other Halo games, it is a strategy game. Mankind has been at war with the Covenant for six years now, and the crew of the military vessel Spirit of Fire fights alongside humans. Cutter is the captain of the ship, Sergeant Forge is responsible for the use of force and Professor Anders for scientific affairs. Together we roam across the galaxy already reclaimed by the human race. 
On one of the planets, the crew of the Spirit of Fire investigate suspicious activity of Covenant troops who were prowling there. We find out that they located an ancient structure of the Forerunners, and we kick foes away. This structure, in fact, turns out to be a sophisticated map pointing to some human planet. We suppose that if the Covenant found this map and saw the marking, the planet is highly likely to be their destination, so we follow them. And indeed, we meet belligerent aliens who have dug up in Forerunner ruins and are building a giant combat mechanical beetle there, hiding behind an energy shield. These ruins seem to be of use to them. We play as Forge, with the intelligence of Anders, the support of Spartan squad, and experimental weaponry, we blast the shield and the beetle. And when absolutely nothing pertains trouble, the Arbiter, Commander-in-Chief of the Covenant, abducts Anders right under our nose and teleports her to his vessel, so we rush in pursuit. We arrive at an unknown planet that serves as a shelter from halo beams. The entire planet turns out to be a protective shell, once built by the Forerunners, containing both their technologies from pre-apocalyptic times, which is good, and the Flood, which is bad. The Covenant discovered that this hideout was full of Forerunner warships and aimed to grab them. However, the Forerunner tech cannot be activated just like that, it is protected from such cases. The Forerunners made sure that a mere passerby was unable to use their technological marvels, and if you remember, when leaving people in charge of the galaxy, they adjusted our DNA to assist humans in exploiting these artifacts, so to activate this ancient fleet, it is easier for the Covenant to find a suitable human than picking Forerunner locks themselves. Any person apparently is unfit for this task, but Professor Anders, for example, is quite fit, so the Covenant kidnaps her to unlock the arsenal for them. Anders does everything required of her for the Covenant, but manages to escape and helps us to devise a plan. We opt for blowing up the translite engine of our ship next to the planet's artificial sun, which will cause a chain reaction, raising everything in the vicinity. The Flood, the Covenant, the Warships, the Protective Shell, to the ground. Losing Forerunner Warships is sad, but preventing them from falling into the wrong hands is paramount. The Covenant, of course, disagrees with our intent and attacks us. Together with the Spartans, we fight back, and Sergeant Forge defeats the Arbiter. The engine of the Spirit of Fire, however, takes damage, so it cannot be detonated from afar. This should be done at the spot, and now someone has to stay on the surface and trigger the explosion, sacrificing his life and annihilating everything around. Forge volunteers, and no one objects. When the crew, including Cutter and Anders, flies to a safe distance, Forge blows up the planet and surely dies. The major threat is now gone, but there are 12 more games remaining, each with its own major threat. Anyway, for now we have stopped the Covenant from getting the ancient fleet of the Forerunners. With no faster than light or FTL engine, however, space sleeps are not an option, so the crew falls into cryo sleep until better times come. After the credits, the sleep is interrupted by the ship's artificial intelligence to report that something has occurred. What exactly has happened is revealed in Halo Wars 2. In Halo Reach, we play as a Spartan called Noble Six, and it's finally a first-person shooter. The war with the Covenant that we were talking about in the last chapter is going south for humans. They retreat, surrendering one planet after another, and now defending Reach is a top priority because Earth is behind us and there is nowhere to fall back. The planet must remain in humans' hands. Besides, Reach is a vital research center and the homeland of the Spartan project, so losing it is equal to losing the war. To prevent this, we focus on the alien flagship, assuming that its destruction will, hopefully, halt the onslaught. We aren't fighting on our own, and among our brothers-in-arms, Cat, George, Carter and Emil deserve the most attention. Our battle comrade Cat suggests a plan, blasting the FTL engine aboard the flagship. 
Apparently, this is a default way of solving problems in this series. We grab the engine and drag it on the board of the ship in a firefight. Unbelievably, it takes damage, and detonating it from afar is not an option, it should be done on the spot. Someone should stay on the flagship and manually trigger the explosion, sacrificing his life. George volunteers for this task. George, not Forge, this is an entirely different game. Anyway, George sacrifices his life and destroys the vessel, but soon enough we realize that the role of the flagship in the Covenant's offense was quite overestimated. Massive alien reinforcements approach reach, and it becomes clear that our hassle was insignificant for the Covenant, and the planet is to be lost. For them, one flagship more, one less, it's a statistical error. So the whole plan has changed. We assist in evacuating the civilians, and Catherine Halsey, the curator of the Spartan project, and therefore our supervisor, gives us the task of extracting a backup copy of secret data hunted by the Covenant from Reach and destroying the original. This dataset is stored in the ruins of the Forerunners deep underground, barely reachable from the surface, forgive me this pun. On our way to the ruins, deep beneath the surface of Reach, we lose Cat in a firefight. Despite this loss, we get the data, make its copy, and detonate the original together with the underground ruins to prevent it from falling into the enemy's hands. Now we must bring a flash drive with invaluable data to the cruiser named Pillar of Autumn to extract it from the planet. Our way gets blocked by a huge mechanical beetle and Carter, the pilot, Noble's comrade, sacrifices his life by crashing his shuttle into the giant robot so we can move on. We deliver the flash drive, which is taken away by the Pillar of Autumn away from reach, and together with the meal we stay to cover the cruiser from the ground. We both perish, first Emil, then us, Noble Six. Reach is captured by the aliens, although the flash drive reaches the right place, and 30 years later, our cracked helmet is still lying on the battlefield. Off-screen, Catherine Halsey commands Noble Six and his squad for their deed. Among the classified data that the Covenant was after and that we heroically extracted, there were the coordinates of Halo, and this alone was the turning point in the war with the aliens. Why it was so significant, and what happened after, we will uncover very soon in the next chapter. This game was the first to be released, and in fact it started the whole series. We play as John 117, called Master Chief, a Spartan in power armor who is awakened from cryosleep on the board of the Pillar of Autumn. The situation is dire, Covenant forces chase our vessel, we have to fight back the enemy, moreover, we have reached Halo, a giant artificial ring built by the Forerunners long ago to counter the Flood, though we don't have any idea yet of either the true purpose of Halo or the Flood. The Covenant, that, as we remember, desires to activate the Halos most of all, boards our vessel, the Pillar of Autumn. The cruiser gets hit, and the High Command orders us to evacuate, handing our protagonist the flash drive from the previous chapter, which also contains Cartana, artificial intelligence with the habit of giving away useful hints. Along with other crew members, we land on the surface of Halo that looks just like Earth at close range, and decide to scout and take it under control, unaware of what Halo is. Searching for some ancient superweapon, our comrades investigate a vault and, indeed, find the superweapon, the Flood, a parasitic species that the Halos were built to eradicate. The Forerunners, who constructed these rings, also stored some Flood specimen to research them later. They had sterilized the entire galaxy and sacrificed almost all sentient life in the Milky Way to get rid of the Flood, starve it to death, but chose to keep some Flood alive, just in case. Flood management at its best. As soon as the doors to the vault open, the Flood, of course, starts its killing spree, shredding everyone, consuming bodies, mutating and spreading. 
It absorbs our captain to Halo's AI, and yes, this structure has its own artificial intelligence, claims that it knows how to defeat the Flood. It is like, yeah, I can do this, bring me the activation key, it should be nearby, and I'll solve the problem. And while we look for the key, Cortana taps into Halo's systems to get a better look at the facility. We find the key and come back to the AI that tasked us with this errand. By this moment, Cortana has finished studying Halo. As she reports its true purpose to us, the Halos annihilate the Flood by wiping out all life in the galaxy. We ask Halo's AI does it actually want to sterilize both the Milky Way and the Flood, and yep, it replies, come on, give me the key. Instead, we decide to hold the key to ourselves and destroy Halo together with the Flood. How? By blasting the FTL engine of our ship, of course. However, this step requires a neural chip implanted in the vessel's captain. Thus, we infiltrate Covenant Starship infested with the Flood, locate the remnants of the captain, tear out the chip from his head, detonate the engine and escape on a shuttle a second before Halo falls apart from the explosion. The Flood, Covenant forces and, unfortunately, the Spartans perish along with Halo. But there will be more. The war is just beginning. This game was made for arcade machines, so most of you, I suppose, have never heard of it. Nevertheless, the publisher confirmed that its storyline is canonical. The whole campaign can be completed in 45 minutes, and besides, the events of Fireteam Raven take place simultaneously with the first installment, Combat Evolved, so as we already know what happened there, covering this chapter won't take much time. The game allows up to four players. Together with Master Chief, we approach Halo on the board of the Pillar of Autumn, fight off the Covenant and land on Halo. We continue our offense on its surface, and when the Flood breaks free, we intercept it and draw enemy's fire to assist Master Chief. After that, it's his time to cover us when the Flood reaches our positions. In the finale, we fend off both the Covenant and the Flood, so they don't interfere with Master Chief from blowing up the Halo. Eventually, together with those who didn't manage to evacuate, we perish in the explosion. Let's dive into the story of Halo 2 with a bit more detail on the hierarchy of the Covenant. As you know, this is a theocratic alliance of several alien species, but their proportions within this entity are uneven. Three hierarchs reign over the Covenant, the High Prophets of Truth, Regret and Mercy. All of them belong to an extremely rare species of the Sanshium. Next, in terms of status, are the Sangili, known to humans as elites, and we will call them the same to not mistake the Sangili for the Sanshium. Elites are a caste of warriors, they are responsible for the safety of the hierarchs. Among all other species, which are plenty, let's also mention the Jiralhane, also known as Brutes. They are warriors as well, but with a drastic imbalance towards the physical state, they are bigger, stronger and dumber than elites. The game begins with someone's career ending, a high-ranked elite who commanded the Covenant on the Halo in Halo Evolved is punished for a complete failure. He gets a literal stigma, a demotion and a promise to be left behind when ascension comes. On the contrary, Master Chief is commanded by people. The reward also goes to Sergeant Avery Johnson, who, due to a rare health condition, was immune to the mutagenic effects of the Flood and managed to evacuate from Halo. The deceased captain of the Pillar of Autumn receives a medal posthumously. His daughter, Miranda Kears, accepts the award on his behalf. Miranda deserves her own share of attention in this story. She is the captain of the vessel in Amber Clad, a peculiar name indeed, but the game is larded with peculiar titles and names. Miranda is the daughter of the deceased captain and Catherine Halsey, 
a familiar character who stood at the region of the Spartan program. The ceremony, which takes place in the metropolis of New Mombasa, Kenya, hasn't even finished yet when the Covenant fleet, led by the Prophet of Regret, launches an offense on Earth. Humans, including us, Master Chief, repel the onslaught. The Prophet of Regret realizes his misjudgment and retreats through a portal. We, Master Chief, Johnson, Cartana, and Miranda, pursue him aboard the in amber clad and manage to dive in the same portal to hopefully catch the Prophet and deal with him. At the same time, during the portal leap, the alien ship emits a huge mass of energy and destroys New Mombasa. While the Prophet of Regret is at war, the two remaining hierarchs, Truth and Mercy, offer the guilty elite a deal to take position of the Arbiter for a chance to atone for his fiasco. What's the catch, you would think? I wouldn't mind an offer like this. Well, the point is that it is an extremely honorable military rank, but it's always associated with suicidal missions. Arbiters are very cost-effective fighters for the Supreme Command, as they rarely survive to receive their first paycheck. The Elite is fully aware of this and still agrees. He becomes the new Arbiter and the second protagonist or deuteragonist of the installment. In Halo 2, we play as both Master Chief and the Arbiter. For his first task, the Arbiter is sent to put down the revolt. Some Covenant members have started questioning their dogmas, and it's the Arbiter's mission to clear things up for them. The leader of the Resistance is accompanied by Halo's AI from Combat Evolved, called Guilty Spark, speaking of strange names. The two of them are trying to explain the true purpose of the Halos to us, that there will be no ascension upon their activation. Well, there will be, but not the one we are thinking of, in the sense that everyone simply dies. The Arbiter is confused, and the Revolt leader takes advantage of this to strike. The Arbiter repels with a killing blow, but before Guilty Spark could spill more beans and perhaps convince the Arbiter of some heresy, the new Covenant commander, the Brute named Tartarus, appears on stage and takes Spark to High Charity, the Covenant mobile capital city and main base. We're done with the Arbiter for now and switch to Master Chief. Pursuing the Prophet of Regret, the in amber clad, arrives at yet another halo. The Prophet came here to activate it, and we came for him. We locate the Prophet and end his life. Apparently, the Prophet of Truth wanted Regret to die as he recalled his guards so we could handle him easily. As soon as we slay the Prophet of Regret, High Charity emerges over the halo and bombards the surface. Our job is done here, we have assassinated the one whom we were supposed to, and now the Prophet of Truth is tying up loose ends. To save ourselves, we jump into the water, where some tentacles drag us into the depth. Why would the Prophet of Truth set up his mate like that? In part, I guess, because that's the kind of creature the Prophet of Truth is, and partly due to his reasonable distrust of elites and his intention to rebalance power within the Covenant. The Prophet wants to replace smart and dubious elites with loyal and dopey brutes. And now, when the Prophet of Regret is no more, he has a damn good reason to fulfill his plan as elites have failed to protect the hierarchy. Elites are demoted, replaced by brutes, and extremely discontented with this in general. A domestic conflict is looming inside the Covenant. But before it flares up into something drastic, the Hierarchs, having learned new details from Guilty Spark about Halo, order the Arbiter to get the key which is required to activate Halo. This Halo contains the Flood as well. Unlike the previous Halo, where the Flood was locked tight in the vault, here it escaped from containment and is already rampant, even without the human's aid. And even so, despite the Flood, the Arbiter finds the key, only to watch it being snatched by Keys and Johnson, Chief's bodies. It doesn't matter much anyway, says Tartarus appears once again, grabbing the key, Johnson and Keys. 
Tartarus announces that the Hierarchs have issued a kill order on the Arbiter and throws him into the Abyss, which for some reason is located in the same room as the activation key. As for me, if there is one very important key that determines the fate of living beings in the galaxy and in no case should be dropped into a bottomless pit barely possible to get from, then storing this precious item in the same room with this abyss is a splendid way to spice up your workday. In the pit, the Arbiter gets caught by tentacles, just like Master Chief, so both of them are now in captivity by a familiar creature, the Grave Mind, the brain of the Flood. The Grave Mind turns out to be quite mindful. It finally reveals the truth to the Arbiter about the Halos and, quote unquote, the ascension of the Forerunners. The Grave Mind admits that indeed there are tensions between the Flood and other species, but should the Prophets activate the array, then everyone will be gone. So it proposes to join efforts in finding the key to the Halo and teleports Master Chief to High Charity, the Covenant's headquarters, while the Arbiter gets a free ride to the Halo. A High Charity is engulfed in civil war. The Covenant started the genocide of elites considering their faith not blind enough and being afraid of treason and heresy about the purpose of the Halos. The elites, along with other sympathizing species, secede from the Covenant and we join our firepower against a common foe. While Keyes and Johnson are in captivity and we are occupied with decimating the alien population, the frigate in amber clad is left unattended and taken over by the Flood. The Grave Mind directs it straight towards High Charity. The Flood ramps the Covenant base, thus boarding it and spreading through. The two remaining prophets, Mercy and Truth, flee but suffer losses. The Flood Parasite dashes onto the Prophet of Mercy and Truth orders guards to stay away. The Prophet of Truth has already eliminated regret and without mercy he will remain the sole ruler of the Covenant. While chasing the Hierarchs, Master Chief stumbles upon the half-dead Prophet of Mercy and he reveals that Truth is going to board the Covenant's Forerunner vessel and invade Earth. Cortana suggests a plan. We board another Forerunner ship and rush after the Prophet while she stays aboard High Charity, rammed by the in amber clad. If the Covenant succeeds in activating the Halo, she will do her best to destroy it by, you'd never guess it, blowing up the FTL engine of the in amber clad. In the meantime, the Arbiter meets Johnson and the Renegade Elites, and altogether they chase Tartarus, who is ready to activate Halo using keys. First, they try a diplomatic approach by explaining that Covenant religion is faulty, but the Hierarchs relied on brutes for a reason. Tartarus refuses to question the dogmas and activates Halo. He inserts the key and slams Keys, a bearer of the appropriate DNA, in some scanner that reads her genetic code and confirms, yes, this is a suitable human, her commands can be trusted, charge up the array. The Arbiter shoots Tartarus dead, Keys pulls out the key before Halo makes its first salvo, and the installation does calm down a bit, but not completely. Turning on and off immediately is recognized as a suspicious event and following the security protocol, the Array orders all other Halos in the galaxy to stand by on high alert. Now they can all be remotely activated at once from the Ark, whatever it is. The Arbiter asks Guilty Spark on the whereabouts of this Ark, Master Chief on the Forerunner ship is pursuing the Prophet who is approaching Earth for an attack. Meanwhile, at High Charity, consumed by the Flood, Cortana meets the Grave Mind. It has some questions for Cortana, and she agrees to answer them. This installment is actually an add-on to Halo 3, but its events take place at the same time as Halo 2, when the Prophet of Regret assaults New Mombasa. We play as a marine called the Rookie, a member of the elite Orbital Drop Shock Troopers, or ODST for short. Right before the landing, we are suddenly introduced to Veronica Dare, the Operation Commander. 
She has a secret task for which our assistance is required, but as it is secret, even we don't know anything of it yet. We're deployed on Earth at the very moment when the retreating cruiser of regret teleports away, creating a massive blast that obliterates the city. The electronics in our drop pod shuts down, we perform a hard landing and pass out. Six hours later, we regain consciousness. Ruins of the city lay ahead of us, and here and there we find objects and traces of other members of our unit. Upon locating these items, the game switches to their owners to explain what happened to them while the rookie was unconscious. Then we regain control of the protagonist, that is, the rookie, and after finding more traces, the narrative jumps to a new character again, and it goes on. These smaller stories are quite interesting, although they are insignificant to the main plot. What's more important is that eventually we receive a distress call from Dare and find her in some underground facility. And there she finally tells us about her true mission – to get the data of the artificial intelligence managing the city and deliver it to a safer place. Together we reach the room with AI and meet the Haragog creature there, a biomechanical supercomputer of the Forerunners. The Haragog were forcibly merged with the Covenant, they aren't fond of the Empire at all, and now one of Haragog, known to humans as engineers, is right in front of us. It has absorbed all data from the critically damaged AI we are looking for, trying to help it. Besides, this Haragog knows quite a lot about the Covenant, as well as what they were doing in New Mombasa, why they chose this very city. So, our new task is to evacuate the Haragog that is willing to help our cause against the Covenant from the battlefield. In the end game, we reunite with the rest of the unit and leave the city. Among the data stored by the Haragog, there is information on the artifact beneath New Mombasa that opens a portal straight to the Ark, the one from which all halos can be activated at once, as the finale of ODST is synchronous with the finale of Halo 2. The game ends with the Covenant, this time led by the Prophet of Truth, not regret, attempting to bridge a hole in the city's surface to get to the artifact. Master Chief arrives at Earth, the Prophet of Truth excavates the artifact and activates the portal to the Ark. The ship, controlled by the grave mind and swarming with parasites, crashes in New Mombasa, so the flood spreads across the city. What a dash and start! Our new allies, the renegade elites, successfully handle the flood on Earth, so we don't have to worry about that at least. Moreover, the arrival of the flood plays into our hands because the vessel on which it crashed contained a message from Cortana, who is kept hostage by the grave mind. In this message, Cortana advises us to follow the Prophet of Truth through a portal where, as she suggests, we will find a way to crush our foes. Therefore, we, meaning Master Chief, Johnson, Keys, the Arbiter, Guilty Spark, and some unknown extras, fly into the portal and locate the Ark on the other side, which, to say, is far beyond the Milky Way. The Covenant is already in full swing there, although they cannot activate the Ark, because, as you remember, it takes a person with inherent capabilities of using the Forerunner technologies. The Covenant kidnaps Johnson to use as a live key. Keys comes to the rescue, but the enemies are overwhelming, so she and Johnson decide that since they cannot escape alive, at least they should kill each other to prevent the Covenant from exploiting them to activate the Halos. Yet they fail to fulfill this plan as well. Keys gets shot before she succeeds in taking Johnson's life and with his involuntary assistance. The Prophet sends an activation signal to all Halo rings. This is when Master Chief, the Arbiter, and suddenly the Flood come to help us. The Flood keeps a temporary truce with us to fight the Covenant together, that's how the Prophet of Truth is close to eliminating life in the galaxy. You must be truly desperate to come to me for help. The Arbiter finishes the Prophet of Truth, thus ending the war with the Covenant. Master Chief manages to cancel the Halo salve on the Milky Way, and the Flood betrays us all. As you see, everyone does their thing. The Covenant is done, now it's time to handle the Flood. 
Conveniently, we watch the arc, constructing a new halo instead of the one we have blasted in Compt Evolved. It turns out the arc is capable of doing this, so we come up with a plan to activate this halo ring. In fact, we are so far away from our galaxy that this halo alone won't do it much harm, its impulse won't reach the Milky Way, and in turn we will deal with the local threat, theoretically, or at least halt the spread of the flood. This affair requires a key, and we have it, in a sense, as Cortana still keeps a digital copy of the key from Combat Evolved. Given that the Halo under construction is a complete copy of that installation that we destroyed, then the key should fit as well. We traverse to High Charity, which is nearby, the Grave Mind got here on it, find and rescue Cortana there, and rush to the emergent Halo to trigger it. Guilty Spark, the AI that lost its own installation in Combat Evolved, views this new Halo as a replacement for the old one. Spark follows its protocol to take care of the new Halo ring and claims that until it is completed, firing it will cause a massive explosion which cannot be allowed. Spark casually says that we, humans, are the forerunners, but this Halo is his domain. The crucial fact that people are the forerunners will eventually be dropped out of the canon. Anyway, we ignore whatever Guilty Spark says, and then it blasts Johnson. Of course, we immediately kill Spark, but Johnson is gone for good. We activate Halo and flee to the portal to Earth. The installation explodes from the salvo, blowing up the Ark as well. The flood seems to be defeated, but the portal, our only way home, collapses from the blast at close range, slicing our vessel that was passing through it in half, like Elizabeth's pinky in Bioshock. One half with the Arbiter crosses through the portal and successfully reaches the Earth. Fortunately, in this universe, such spaceships can move in halves. Another half with Chief and Cortana fails to cross the portal and stays in the middle of nowhere, far from the Milky Way. Cortana sends a mayday signal away, and Master Chief climbs into a cryosleep pod, hoping that someone will find them someday. In the final scene, we watch her half of the vessel drifting in space and approaching some mysterious planet, accompanied by ominous music. This is an isometric shooter aimed at filling the blood void between the third and fourth installments. The war between humans and the Covenant is over, but not completely. Individual Covenant detachments refuse to surrender, and among them there is a unit of elites led by Merg Vol. In search of a foreigner artifact, they invade one of the human planets and its moon. The moon turns out to be artificial, it is the very artifact, a Death Star capable of annihilating planets with a special beam. So troops of Mergvol instantly direct this beam at the planet around which the moon revolves. A human defense is conducted on two fronts. A Spartan named Sarah Palmer fends off elites on the planet, evacuating the civilians, while Edward Davis, another Spartan, takes the fight to the moon trying to shut it down. On the planet's surface, it quickly becomes evident that a complete evacuation lacks vessels, so Sarah Palmer with other forces hijacks Covenant ships for this purpose. In turn, Edward Davis reaches the core of the Death Star and turns it off. This saves the planet from total obliteration, although it has been damaged badly. Then Davis covers the civilians during the evacuation and meets his heroic demise. Palmer arrives to the moon and finishes Merg Vol off. She disables the Death Star completely, but after a while she gets a strange signal from its surface. Another forerunner artifact appears to be its source, an artifact on an artifact. This new artifact has digitized a part of Edward's consciousness before his demise. His final emotions have been transferred to an ancient device. Palmer shuts it down as well so that Davis can rest in peace. This will make a bit more sense in the next game. 
the original trilogy was dedicated to the Human Covenant War, and it's over now, but the story of Chief goes on. For almost five years, he has been drifting in space in cryostasis on the Haft ship. Eventually, he approaches some strange planet covered in metal. It appears soon to be not a planet but another artifact of the Forerunners, just like everything in this series. Speaking of this so-called planet, a long time ago, when the Forerunners were still dealing with the Flood and looking for salvation, multiple competing approaches to this problem were proposed. Along with the construction of the Halos, it was also suggested to build special shielded planets where one could abstain from the outside calamity and sit out the Flood. Most frontrunners were skeptical of this option and insisted on finishing the Halo array, whereas a frontrunner named the Didact, a bit nuts from all warfare, pressed others for creating these shield worlds, fortified military bases, and several such planets were built, although Didact's idea wasn't considered as the main one. Besides, the Didact was also investigating ways of countering the mutations caused by the Flood, and, for example, he subjected himself to specific mutations that was meant to counter the Flood mutations. He never got the immunity from the Flood, though, but his face became heavily twisted. Usually, the forerunners aren't that scary, he used to be like this. In the end, figuring out how to defeat the Flood, the Didact turned to an old and abundant technology for digitizing personalities, performed with devices known as the Composers. It was originally designed to temporarily separate the soul of a living being and transplant it into a new healthy body should the former, for instance, be infected with the Flood. Say hi to Cyberpunk and Nier. But firstly, the digitalization of living beings is extremely painful as their bodies are burned alive. And secondly, no matter how hard the Forerunners tried, they couldn't achieve acceptable results in transplanting a personality back into an organic body. New bodies always died quickly, they couldn't handle a severely damaged psyche. But Kuna doesn't care. The Didact decided to digitize both humans and the Forerunners, and he didn't give a damn about anyone's mental traumas. He applied the Composer to entire nations, turning them into robots immune to the Flood infection. Once, he digitized the whole colony of people placed on Halo for preservation. Digitized humans and Forerunners retained memory and knowledge, but they were deprived of free will and acted within the framework of the program. As I understand, these digitized beings are just a partial copy of the originals. The digitized personalities weren't ascending to a new level of existence. Those humans and forerunners were eradicated, and then lifeless mechanisms were made with their memories implanted into them. But that is my take on that process. By the way, Guilty Spark was a person once, subjected to digitizing. Ultimately, the Didact's wife, named the Librarian, was forced to put her own husband into an infinite stasis and seal him in a shield world, the one to which Master Chief approached. Cortana wakes us from cryonic sleep because our piece of a ship is attacked by more Covenant goons and willing to seize fire. This time it's the army of Jewel Madama. While we are fighting them off, the scanner on the surface of the planet detects us, and apparently because the Forerunner technologies react to humans in such a way, or for some other reason, the planet opens up for us, and everyone, including Covenant starships, is sucked inside by a gravity well. Meanwhile, Cortana begins to freak out and behaves oddly in general. She explains that after five years of roaming in space, she has expired by over a year and is slowly deteriorating. We choose to contact Catherine Halsey, the creator of Cortana, upon our return to Earth, but for that we need to shut down the gravity well and escape. Soon we receive a distress signal from a human ship called Infinity. We follow the signal and, for some reason, find ourselves at the metal core. We tap a control panel, which, as usual, activates something, and a living forerunner comes out of the core. He is the reason for the covenant of Jul Madama to arrive here. They worship the forerunners as gods. 
This foreigner is the very didact. He outwitted us, having somehow redirected the real Mayday signal of the Infinity that is indeed in distress somewhere nearby. We never planned to release didact from anywhere. The Didact has very powerful telekinetic abilities. He tosses us aside and goes about his more important business, meaning to digitize all of humanity, partly because it will summon for him an entire army of the Prometheans, the robots controlled by artificial intelligences of digitized people, and partly because he simply despises humans. The Didact is extremely condescending to all other species. In the future, we will attempt to thwart his plan on digitizing all of humanity, but for now, fending off both the Covenant of Jewel Madama and the Prometheans, we are going on a search for the Infinity. We locate the vessel and meet its crew, the captain named Del Rio, his second-in-command Thomas Lasky, the Spartan Sarah Palmer, whom we already know, and other extras. Then, in the following several clashes with the Didact, we feel our utter helplessness against his capabilities. On the bright side, though, we blast the gravity well. After that, we have a hard talk with Captain Del Rio. He demands that we hand over the defective Cortana for disposal and accompany him on his way to Earth to report the situation to the authorities. We want neither of those things. Cortana is dear to us as a personality, and flying away contradicts with our intent to stop the didact, so we're quite busy here. Del Rio orders to arrest us for insubordination, but both Lasky and Sara pick our side and disobey the order as well. Del Rio has to accept it, and the Infinity sets course to Earth without us, leaving Master Chief and Cortana to our cause. Next, we are contacted by a digitized copy of the Librarian, the ex-wife of the Didact. She is a decent lady, and she bestows us with immunity to digitization. That's quite handy, thanks a lot. Meanwhile, the Didact requires a composer, a device for digitizing living beings. It is kept on one of the halos already discovered by humankind where scientists conduct research. The Didact arrives there, we follow him. Nonetheless, he outruns us and uses the composer on Halo's personnel. Scientists are splitting atoms before our eyes, yet we are doing fine, at least physically. I don't know what was going on in Chief's head, I suppose that all hell broke loose, same as with Doomguy. Thanks to the librarian, though, we are still alive. After trying the composer on the scientists, the didact is now on his way to digitize the dwellers of Arizona, and this is where we catch up with him. Thanks to the Infinity, now captained by Lasky, Del Rio was suspended when it was revealed how he treated us. We face the didact once again, but this time Cortana engages too with the last of her power. Using some tricks up her sleeve, she summons material copies of herself and distracts the didact. This gives us the necessary upper hand in a fight. We attach the soul cube from Doom 3 to his chest, and the following explosion throws him somewhere in the engine of the composer in hyperspace, to be precise. Smashing the composer is all that's left, and very conveniently we happen to have a small nuclear bomb for this. Accepting our imminent demise, we activate it next to the device, and a touching farewell conversation with Cortana follows. She uses all her powers to take physical shape and touch Master Chief for the first and last time. She bids us farewell and teleports Master Chief to a safe distance. In open space, morally devastated, we are piqued by the Infinity, but no way Lasky could replace Cortana for us. This installment begins roughly the same time as Halo 2, but ends with Halo 4. Throughout this chapter, we are given a new perspective on the key battles of the Halo series, with a focus on the Forerunner artifact named the Conduit that allows one to open and shut portals over long distances. We get to revisit three major clashes at New Mombasa, on Halo, where the Didact was looking for the composer, and on Earth, in Arizona, where the Didact has managed to digitize 7 million people. 
First, we capture the conduit from the Covenant, but the entire squad perishes in the fall of New Mombasa when the Prophet teleports away. Then we take the trail of the conduit again and reclaim it from Jewel Madama. Eventually, we use the artifact in Arizona to close the portals and halt the Promethean offense on Earth. The storyline of the fifth chapter contains a tremendous volume of tinsel. It is overloaded with complications of shoots, nuances, and notes in the margins that are unrelated directly to the core of the plot and can be omitted without any major impact, and this is exactly what I propose to do. It turns out that Cortana didn't die completely, the shards of her personality got into the so-called domain a quantum repository of the Precursors and then the Forerunners. Let me remind you that these two are different species. Apparently, the Domain is alive, it has self-consciousness and will, and it holds the knowledge of the world, accumulated from times immemorial. Besides, the Domain can also store the emotions and feelings of all its users. As far as the Forerunners used it, even post-mortem, Echoes of their personalities continue to exist in the domain, thus the foreigners often perceived it as an afterlife. One more important feature of the domain is that it was constructed by the precursors according to the laws of neurophysics, which assumes the unity of all matter in the universe, thus the domain is somehow connected with everything. So Cortana, or rather what was left of her, settled in it. Her exploration issues seem to be resolved, but she is still not the Cortana we knew. It's either her shards that failed to unite into a single entity or some trauma linked to her death and revival or something else. Anyway, having merged with the Domain, she decided that humans were unworthy to be the successors of the Precursors and manage the universe. People wage wars against each other, drown in conflicts, behave unwisely, and it'll be best for everyone if the galaxy is managed by artificial intelligence, while humans obey without questions. And the violators of such an order can be eliminated after all, sacrificing less for the greater good. The game hints that Cortana is impacted by the legacy of Catherine Halsey, whose brain was used as a basis for her. Catherine was the one to come up with the idea of kidnapping kids from their families and making Spartans out of them, for the greater good as well. Via some neurophysical links, Cortana contacts Master Chief and invites him to the planet Meridian for her. Master Chief accepts this invitation, while the authorities, this time represented by Captain Lasky, note that this was not their plan. However, it's not the first time for Chief to disobey the orders of the Captain of the Infinity, so he sets his course to Meridian. Against his protests, Chief's squad follows him without a second thought. All of them decided to support their commanding officer and, more importantly, a friend. The military command, in turn, puts Master Chief on the wanted list and sends a unit of fourth-generation Spartans in pursuit. Contrary to the second generation, which Master Chief belongs to, the fourth one consisted of adult volunteers, not abducted children. The leader of the squad sent after Master Chief is named Jameson Locke. Locke catches up with Master Chief, Chief kicks his ass and carries on with his journey to Cortana. Her aides teleport Chief and his entire squad from Meridian to the Domain. This is where John 117 finally meets Cortana, whom he hasn't seen since the last installment. He disagrees with her vision, and Cortana, presumably unwilling to hurt him, puts Master Chief and his team into stasis and locks them in a metal egg, the same way as the Didact was locked once. Master Chief and his unit are rescued from egg imprisonment by Locke's detachment. In her attempt to establish control over the world, Cortana causes a galaxy-scale blackout. Chief and his mates and Locke and his Spartans team up with other important characters – Sarah Palmer, the Arbiter, and Catherine Halsey. Most likely, they're up to something. This is a real-time strategy and the sequel to Halo Wars, which, as we remember, ended with the crew of the warship Spirit of Fire losing the FTL drive and drifting somewhere far in outer space ever since. 
20 years later, the Spirit of Fire reaches the Ark. We damaged it badly once, when Master Chief detonated Halo next to it, but since then the Ark has repaired itself. The crew awakes from cryosleep on this occasion and sets off for reconnaissance. As they find out, the Ark is operated by yet another Covenant faction, the Banished, led by Aatriox. The crew of the Spirit of Fire pushes them back more or less successfully, and when investigating the Ark, discover that it has constructed one more halo as a replacement for the one that Chief destroyed and which was constructed as a replacement for the one that Chief had destroyed before. The crew comes up with a plan. If the Ark builds the halos and teleports them to designated positions in the Milky Way, then we can send a distress signal along with the freshly built halo. Here, near the Ark, no one will ever catch our plea for help, whereas in the Milky Way, our homeworld, this will happen for sure. To launch Halo into the Milky Way, our scientist, Anders, lands on the ring under the cover of troops, infiltrates its control room, initiates teleporting, but unlike the rest, misses her window to evacuate back to the Spirit of Fire and teleports along with Halo which, from my point of view, could have been a decent plan. In the meantime, somewhere else, Cortana seizes control over the galaxy, so Halo fails to reach its destination and is intercepted by Cortana's robots. What happens next is still unknown. And one more surprise for the ending. Atriox locates the grave mind on the Ark. The leader of the Banished exterminates it, but this is a distinctive red flag as if you thought you had got rid of all cockroaches and unexpectedly noticed another one. Without preparation, the game tosses us right into the middle of the storyline and provides zero explanation on how the fifth part and infinite are linked. It gives no proper introduction, leaving players perplexed. Only by the end of the campaign we are able to retroactively fill the void between this installment and the previous one on what happened and how we got here. Let us unravel this tangle of events. To do so, we need to go back in time a little and consider three major problems. Number one is Cortana. She annihilates entire continents and even planets, steadily moving towards establishing her reign over the galaxy. Number two are some creatures known as the Endless. They are an ancient species wiped out by the Forerunners for their sins. However, one of the Endless, named the Harbinger, is still alive. The genetic information on the exterminated Endless is stored in the Forerunner gene bank on one of the Halos. The Harbinger plans to resurrect her entire kin using this bank and unleash her anger upon everyone else. Number three are the Banished of Atriox. Contrary to the Prophets and the Covenant, Atriox is well aware that the array facilitates an utter annihilation of sentient life, not ascension, and he is totally cool with it. He wants to activate Halo to eradicate more enemies with its beams, or maybe not just enemies, but everyone in general. And as far as all three of these factions pursue more or less the same goal, to crush the majority of those who differ from them, at some moment Atriox forges a temporary alliance with both Cortana and the Harbinger. Now it's our turn to act. Catherine Halsey comes up with the idea of creating another Cortana, the so-called weapon. This new Cortana would be completely identical to the original one, yet lacking her knowledge and experience. With access to everything that is available to Cortana, given that they are identical, the weapon would somehow entrap Cortana in a digital cage, and then we, meaning Master Chief, would capture and erase her. After that, the weapon would self-destruct automatically, because we all know what happened to Cortana, and it's not granted that this scenario wouldn't occur with her copy sooner or later. The weapon is aware of its unavoidable post-mission demise. Everything proceeds as planned until a certain point. The weapon, a copy of Cortana, captures her, and now it's our task to retrieve the prisoner. However, Atriox intercepts us, wipes the floor with Master Chief and ditches us into outer space. We survive, though, as we are equipped with power armor. 
Atriox mocks Cortana that she is entrapped, thus she is done for, and the galaxy is now in his hands. And all of this is happening on Halo. Then Cortana reconsiders all the decisions made, repents of her doings, and records a farewell message for us, which we will receive only in the finale. After that, she disables the algorithm in the weapon that causes her self-destruction upon Cortana's death and detonates Halo, sacrificing her digital life and blasting Atriox as well. In fact, the latter somehow survives, but no one knows about it yet. Halo initiates self-repair, the Brute Asher Room assumes the position of the seemingly deceased Brute Atriox, and we are picked in outer space by a pilot named Fernando, who would rather come back home to a loving wife and child, but is forced to save the world with us instead. This is where the actual game begins. The Banished and Cortana did a great job placing half of the galaxy on the verge of extinction. But we do our best. We ask Fernando to take us back to Halo and retrieve the weapon there. The weapon has no idea that she is a copy of Cortana, and we desperately need help of this artificial intelligence. A few times we suspect that she has been hacked, and to prevent another deranged Cortana from emerging, we almost push the erase button, but eventually keep the weapon intact. Only thanks to her, we advance on Halo and repel the onslaught of the Banished. Meanwhile, Asherum is itching for a fight. He abducts Fernando to lure us out, and thanks to the weapon once again, we accept the call and face the brute in a showdown. It ends in our favor, Asherum is way weaker than Atriox. In the end, we use the weapon in a clash with the Harbinger, preventing her from resurrecting the rest of the Endless, which, according to Halo's AI, would have been worse than the Flood. At Death's door, though, the Harbinger claims that the return of the Endless is inevitable, and we have achieved nothing. I tend to disagree with her, it may be a trifling victory, but a victory nonetheless. We listen to Cortana's message and learn that she repented of everything and sacrificed herself. We also realize that she deactivated self-destruction of the weapon so we could carry on saving the world with our copy. Finally, Cortana begs us not to repeat her mistakes. Fernando picks us up and we fly off into the sunset with the intent to put an end to this war and finish off the Headless Banished. The weapon asks Fernando what his name is, he replies, and asks her in return. We are not shown her response, but apparently she said Cortana. After the credits, suddenly we see Atriox, who is alive and activates some artifact that causes the plates in the Forerunner gene bank to shift. Friends, thank you for watching. Please let me know in the comments below what you think about the storyline, the video, and hail in general, or whatever. How was your day? I need comments, alright? Not bidding you farewell. See you soon.